Where does yesterday's future, which is already here, ready, here, ready, here, ready, here, meet today's future, which is about to happen, and tomorrow's future, which could be just minutes away? Welcome to Technology Revolution, the future of now. Where host Bonnie D. Graham asks savvy futurists for their predictions about the tech-driven trends that are shaping our future right now. Here's your host who will take us into the future of now, Bonnie D. Graham. Bonnie in the house. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I always get a kick out of that intro. The voice is by, it, it's, it's by my friend and my colleague who is a Ryan Treasure at Voice America. He's the VP of everything I call him, VP of Operations Technology. And I asked him especially to do the voiceover for the opening because he has such a cool voice. Yes, this is the future of now. And we're going to talk about a very interesting topic. Let me ask everybody in our listening audience, are you hungry? Do you have plans for dinner? Well, are you cooking? Are you unfreezing? Are you defrosting? Are you using leftovers? Or are you using a delivery app? I have breaking news for you. The buzz is that European-based Just Eat Takeaway, which was a combination of a company called Just Eat and a combination of Takeaway together, Just Eat Takeaway, they are going to be acquiring their U.S. competitor Grubhub. The deal is worth $7.3 billion. Chew on that, kids. $7.3 billion. They're beating out Uber in the deal, and they will have an active customer base of $70 million. Now, delivery apps, maybe you're using them, maybe you're not, but I found an article in the New York Times recently about an, a restaurant in Brooklyn, New York. I'm from New York, but not Brooklyn, called Glassery, a Mediterranean restaurant, and they experimented with delivery apps, takeout apps, seamless Grubhub, DoorDash, and they said it really wasn't going so well for them. There were difficulties using the apps, updating the menus was slow, asking for changes was very delayed, so they weren't too happy. So I've invited four experts in the food field to help us figure out what is going on with delivery apps. Are they going to be here? Are they going to be here something for us to use for dining pleasure going forward? Or are they just a flash in the pan? Oh, I like that, a flash in the pan. That's a food reference. Everybody can smile. I have my four, four panelists today, and they're here with me on Zoom. I have the pleasure of seeing their smiling faces. Some of them are very serious. And some of them are very smiling. And some of them are saying, what? She wants us to smile. So if anybody has a visual expression during the show, I will translate it for the listening audience because you can't see them and I can. So my special panelists today are Chef Chris Hall of, I'm going to let him pronounce the name of his company in a minute, Local 3 and 5 Restaurants and The Giving Kitchen, quite a guy. He has a lot to share with us. Randy Evans from SAP. Randy's been on Game Changers with me before. Evan Bowler and David Gruen. Welcome everybody. And our topic today is what's for dinner or who's cooking the future of meal delivery apps. I'm Bonnie D. Graham in the house and let's get started with our hopefully yummy topic, Chef Chris Hall. Welcome. You're a newcomer to my shows. I'm very happy to have you. And a shout out to Carrie Brown. I believe she was the one who introduced us. So, Chris, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I'm a chef and partner in a restaurant company called Unsuke, which is an entirely fabricated word for doesn't suck. Uh, <laughs> we have five restaurants in Atlanta and... Uh, we're changing the model of the way we do business due to COVID and everything else going on in the world. So it's been an interesting couple months. Chris, tell me a little bit about your thoughts about delivery apps. Are they working for you? We're not looking for bashing or trashing any particular app. We just want to know reality check. You're in the restaurant business. What do you see? Uh, you know, we see it's an important part of the space. Uh, we've chosen to go a different way. We've taken it in house. So the apps aren't working to me. I think in particular, it's been interesting to note that this week both Portland and New York City put a cap on the fees that uh, delivery apps are allowed to charge people. New York City's at 15% um, and Portland's at 10. That's down from the general when we first started investigating this several years ago. It was between 30 and 35%. So it's just been interesting to see that trend emerge uh, and how that's going. So delivery is an important part of business as is carry out now and it's something that's here to stay. I don't think it's going to go away. Thank you very much. Again, pleasure to have you, and thank you for taking time, and we'll learn more about you. Tell us about The Giving Kitchen before I move to Randy. Tell us what you uh, do. The Giving Kitchen is a charity. Uh, we're in the state of Georgia, but we hope to be national soon, which assists restaurant workers in crisis. So if you work in the hospitality industry and you come upon uh, sort of an unexpected crisis, whether it's someone in your family gets COVID, whether it's you break a leg, you're in a car accident, you get cancer, 
we're, we're there to keep you from from ruin, essentially. So we make sure you're you're fed and you're housed and you're clothed and all those needs are taken care of. A chef with a heart. Thank you very much. I think anybody who is in the restaurant business, Chris, has a heart because serving food is part of a the culture of the world, isn't it, Chris? Everybody. Food is something that brings us together, that gives us history. It gives us love. It's a way to sustain us at the basic level. Food is what we need. It's the fuel, like the gas in the car or the diesel. But food has a special place in every culture in the history of the world, and, and we're very happy to have you here. Randy Evans, in case there's one person in the world who doesn't really remember who you are from having been on my radio show so many times. We know we made you famous, Randy. I'm only teasing, but not all together. Randy, tell everybody who you are and bring us up to date. What's your thoughts on this topic? So I'm Randy Evans. Uh, my official title is Industry Executive Advisor uh, for Food, Drug, and Convenience within the SAP Advisory Practice. Um, basically, I, I, um, I'm, I'm the industry uh, representative. I have worked in the grocery business for 30 years. And uh, so I help um, our company um, understand what our customers are asking for and I help um, our customers understand what we are offering. So it's a, it's a great job. And it's a, I think this is a fantastic topic. Um, as this whole lockdown, quarantine, whatever metaphor you want to use for it, has dramatically changed the landscape of the food business. Um, and and the the concept of home delivery for a lot of folks for food was not something that you know that was something that the millennials used but uh, I think the 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 universal problems of of quarantine have caused it to be a, a topic on everybody's mind um, I also think that um, that like Chris said, I, I believe that companies are going to take it in-house. I think that when you outsource your customer service, um, you take a risk that you're not going to be represented properly at the front door. Um, and I believe that, um, that it's important for the industry, whether it's food service or it's grocery, um, has a direct connection to their customers. And giving that to somebody else is never a recipe for success. Randy, when you say taking it in-house, could you just define that for us, please? I know Chris mentioned it also. What is that method? I think it means that the companies um, that are um, that are doing it, are they're giving it to another company. They're outsourcing it, giving it to a third party. Bringing in-house means I'm not going to. I'm going to have home delivery, but I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to provide the technology. I'm going to have, provide the transportation and I'm going to be the, I'm going to be standing at your door versus I have no idea who's standing at your door representing me. Do you think the consumer cares how the food gets there as long as it's a good meal? And if they are buying something from Chris Hall's restaurant, they want to make sure it's tastes and looks as good as if they were sitting at a table, which they may or may I, not be able I, to do right now. What do you think? I absolutely think they, they, it's a requirement. And when they order something from Chris Hall, Whoever shows up at their door is Chris Hall. Ah. Um, and, and if it's not a, an appropriate person or whatever, I mean, if it's not a, a good experience, then Chris Hall takes the hit, not Uber Eats or whatever the name of the company is, Grubhub, you name it. Um, they're out of the picture. They're not the quality deliverer. Chris Hall is. And, and I think that's why I, I bet you that's why Chris decided <laughs> we're not going to do this. Plus, you lose control of costs. And there's just a lot of list of stuff that can go wrong. And I believe that it will be uh, it'll be uh, a battle and the c competition winners will be the ones that say, I'm going to go all the way to my customer's house and not give it to somebody else. Thank you, Randy. Interesting points there. Chris is nodding. Dave is now. We haven't gotten to Dave. Evan Bowler, you're up next. Evan, welcome. How are you? You're smiling. Your, your visual background, you're somewhere in a very reedy, grassy place with a lot of sunshine, and there's fresh dew on these big green leaves coming up behind you, and it's very refreshing. I think we need a pina colada to go along with your background. <laughs> I wish my listeners could see you. Evan, please introduce yourself to everybody. Thank you, Bonnie. I'm doing great, and yeah, I'm embracing the feel of summer with my background, that's for sure. <laughs> 
Um, so I'm, I'm Evan Bowler. I'm an, just like Randy, I'm an industry executive advisor for SAP. I'm actually under our retail um, practice, but I focus on our quick serve and restaurant customers. So um, very similar to Randy, work with our customer base and help um, educate internally as well as our customer, um, kind of what the needs of our customers are in the industry and how we can do better. Um, and then also help, you know, educate our customers on how we um, you know, how we help the industry and, and where our, our big value buckets are. Um, I, I just, I think that you guys are stealing a lot of my thunder with this initial uh, conversation. We'll, we'll, we'll get to the, um, to the quotes in a minute, but I think my quotes were very in, were very in the vein of what you guys were talking about. And um, I think that when it comes to food delivery, right, um, from a technology perspective, there's a lot of challenges, right? Um, the industry is facing a lot of uphill battles right now, and it, it's not, it's not the same for everybody, but um, I think that you can remove a lot of the mystery from the whole, um, the whole topic if you really just focus on the experience of your customers, right? And then also the inverse of that, the experience of your own employees and how, um, you know, they're able to um, incorporate this delivery app into their operations and their day-to-day -day work, right? And, and is, it, is it more work for them? Do they have to go above and beyond? Um, or is it just kind of an incorporated part of what they're already doing? So, um, I think that it's kind of all about the experience. If you focus on the experience and creating a great one, um, you know, both for your employees, but then also for your end customers, I think that it kind of all starts there. Thank you, Evan. Great points about employees too. We needed to say that. Uh, do you use a food delivery app ever, Evan? Um, you know what? I've just moved. I've made a move out to the suburbs. I'm in the Chicagoland area. Um, but when I was when I was in the city, when I was living downtown, like almost every day, right? It's It was a big part of urban life um, being in downtown Chicago. So um, lots of Grubhubs. And I think that's another thing too, right? It's depending on the delivery app service that you use, it, it's a different experience each time, right? So it's how do you create a consistent experience across delivery channels, right? If you're using multiple, which in a lot of cases, some people are. Thank you very much. David Gruen, I haven't forgotten you, dear. Why don't you tell us and remind us? There might be 1.3 people in the world who don't know who you are, David, but just on the case that you can talk to them. I know they're listening and refresh us. What are you doing and what's your take? We've had some good conversations so far. David, you're up. Well, hello, Bonnie. It's good to talk with you again. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dave Gruen. I am a very passionate musician and technophile. You said you were a drummer early on. Yes. I've been a drummer for 50 years. So there's a, there's a huge correlation between musicians and technology, I've found. But uh, I've been in uh, technology-focused retail for about almost 30 years. Uh, my official title is the uh, Global Industry Principal for Retail and Grocery for SAP, focused on our customer experience mm -hmm. technologies. And I, and I work uh, very closely with Randy in helping uh, global retailers really understand uh, big shifts like what we're going through now. And it, what's interesting to me about what's going on, this, this curveball that life has thrown us um, has, in my opinion, dynamically shifted the entire food experience di um, paradigm um, forever. And for two reasons. One, it's global. Everybody's been impacted. I, I've never in my career uh, been on the phone with uh, multiple people in multiple countries where everyone is going through almost the exact same experience. And secondly, um, with this type of um, tipping point event, uh, we've got entire demographics of people who never would have gone digital with any part of the food experience, whether it was grocery shopping or, or restaurant uh, food delivery that were forced to. And it's expanded their paradigm in ways they never could have imagined. And that's dynamically changed the entire food experience just because of the infusion of their input that we would never have experienced otherwise. So it's a fascinating time. It, it certainly is. And Dave, have you used any home delivery for food? Any apps? Well, absolutely. I mean, my, my role pretty much demands that um, I, f I learn by experience. So I started uh, a little over a year and a half ago um, with all the food deliveries, whether it was the Grubhubs or the online grocery delivery. I tried every one of them, Instacart, just to find out what the experience was so that I can be an expert in this area. And it's fascinating. And, and I'll reiterate Randy's point. Whoever owns that last mile is the customer. They're the face of the customer. Um, and, and the smart ones, and if you notice what Instacart's doing with you know, hiring 300,000 people to advance their fleet, uh, the smart ones will figure out how to take advantage of that and own that relationship. 
and think about the impact on for grocers, for example. I mean, all of a sudden they've become dark stores for Instacart, uh, and and Instacart could end up being a broker for the for the customer, uh, and that changes everything. So these these are the things we have to help uh, people be aware of because it's changing that fast. Thank you, Dave. I'm glad you brought that up. I have been doing my own grocery shopping only for the past four weeks. I go on a Sunday. I go to a store not in my neighborhood because I know the local Harris Teeter is jam-packed and most people are not wearing masks, I've been told. So I go to a store about five miles away. It's a brand new Publix. They've got arrows on the floor. But my point, Dave, is that I started seeing people with green T-shirts that said Instacart Absolutely. all yep. over the store. Sometimes they're following the arrows down the aisle. Sometimes they're going the opposite way. But there are they're there every Sunday morning. I'm there by 8.30 on Sunday. I do a week's shopping. I try to anticipate what I need. And I didn't know anything about them. And there they are. Dave, you want to make a quick comment on that? Well, yeah, just, I mean, yeah, number one, you're absolutely correct. And guess what those people are doing? And this is based on my own experience. They're chatting with the customer. Oh, we don't have this. How about this? Or would you look, or I'm texting them saying, oh, listen, while you're in there, because they've told me they're there. Can you pick me up some grapes? I forgot to put that on there. That's where the relationship's being built. I wondered how that worked. I have a friend in Florida who, this is an interesting um, interesting way of getting around everything. She won't go to the grocery store and her mother is just turned 99 and lives a couple miles away in the same community. But what she does is she has hired her cleaning person, the woman who does domestic household work. She said, don't come in my house and clean be my grocery shopper. So she gives this woman, she pays her the equivalent of coming and cleaning the house every two weeks. She gives her the money in cash. And then this woman goes and does shopping for my friend and for her mother and delivers to their doors. So this is almost a private Instacart delivery. Fascinating. That's what I was talking about. The shift of the experience is this. You never know what's going to happen, but you just know things are going to happen. We're all trying to cope, right? We're all trying to figure the damn thing out. That's all I could do. And I once went on a Sunday at one in the afternoon. The store was crowded and I got nervous. I was not happy being with so many people in those aisles. And now there's a sign at the door, customers must wear a mask. They can't enforce it, they told me. I talked to the manager, but they do encourage it. So here we go. This is the part of the show. Great conversation, by the way, everyone already. Chris Hall, you're up first. I have asked my panelists to send me an interesting quote that on the surface has absolutely nothing to do with the topic of the show. And we're going to find out why they picked the quote and how it relates to the topic in their own words. Chef Chris Hall, I have to call you chef. I respect that. Chris has sent us a quote from Slim Charles in The Wire. I had no idea who that was. Let me read briefly. Slim Charles is a fictional character in the HBO drama The Wire, played by Anwan Glover, an enforcer for the Barks Hill organization and later the top lieutenant of Kingpin Proposition Joe. He's portrayed as principled, loyal, and competent throughout his career. And it's about drugs. And Slim Charles is effectively the last man standing at the end of the theater as everybody's either dead or incarcerated or something other. So here's the quote Chris has picked. Chris, I can't wait for this one. Let me put you on speaker view. Chris, the quote is, the thing about the old days, they the old days. Chris, talk to me. Days. So I chose it for a couple of reasons. One, if you haven't seen The Wire, you need to watch it. It's the most Dickensian sort of piece that's been done in the last 20 years. It will be 150 years from now what people reference when they talk about the American city. It won't be a book. It will be on celluloid and it will be The Wire. Um, and I chose that just because I am, quite frankly, dead tired of hearing about the old ways and the new normal. Like it's, it's just the normal. It's not the new normal. Like the old days is the old days and they, the old days they're dead. And if your organization or your thinking is we're going back to the old days or we're pining for the old days, like you're going to be a dinosaur, right? This is truly the most in, in my business in the restaurant business, the most, um, the greatest example of Darwinism that's out there And it actually is working in my favor because I'm not a large monolithic giant organization. Too many people think it's about being strong. It's about being adaptable, right? Can you adapt? Can you quickly change, pivot, move courses, and do that? And so I chose that quote, um, one, because I I love the series. I really think everyone should watch it. And uh, two, because the old days are the old days, and they're not coming back in – We need to get on to the new days, which are these days that we're in right now and figure out how we're going to adapt and and overcome and and 
continue on. Chris, truer words were never spoken. And I was telling some of you before the show that people say it's the new normal. I call it the new abnormal because if you're referencing back, Krista, the way we things were, what, four months ago, 18 weeks ago, 20 weeks ago when everything was okay, we thought it was okay, we believed it was okay, and now so much is coming to our attention that really probably wasn't okay, but we accepted it, we lived with it, and now we're in something that is abnormal compared to that, but you're right, this is the life we have right now, and we have to deal with adaptability, agility, ability to pivot. Chris, that's the key for any organization, any business, in any industry, and it also is the key for us personally to survive and get through this. So thank you, Chris. Wonderful quote, and I will check out The Wire. I usually find binge-worthy series that have one name. Nikita, Shooter. Um, what did we just watch? Um, uh, well, I made, a, made an exception for Money Heist. That's two words, but it's great. Um, I just finished uh, Unwanted, and I just finished Rake. If you haven't seen Rake, take a look at it. If you can stand the Australian accents, you're going to get a kick out of it. Randy Evans is up next. Randy has sent us a quote from Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. The Dark Side of the Moon is the eighth studio album by English rock band Pink Floyd, released in 1973 by Harvest Record, in case anybody cares, primarily developed during live performances. It was a concept album with themes exploring conflict, greed, time, death, and mental illness, and it is among the most critically acclaimed records in history. How about that? Often featured on professional listings of the greatest albums, estimated sales of over 45 million copies. It is Pink Floyd's bestseller and one of the best-selling albums worldwide ever. Here is the quote. You run, and you run to catch up with the sun, but it's sinking, racing around to come up behind you again. The sun is the same in a relative way, but you're older, shorter of breath. One day, curse it to death. Oh, mm. my. Oh, my. Oh, my. Randy, talk to me. What does this have to do with our so, talk today? Imagine, imagine in 1973, I'm in eighth grade, and I'm, I'm into rock music, and, I'm, and I like Pink Floyd, but I never really listened to the words. It was always about the music. And the music on the album is spectacular. And by the way, I did say album. Because it was definitely vinyl. Yes. <laughs> and and I I stopped for a second and I listened to the word. This song is called Time. And I and that line in 1973 completely blew my mind. And I'm, you know, eighth grade, what do I care about? Stupid concepts like the sun is the same in a relative way. Um, but it was it was incredible. And from that moment on, I was an ardent Pink Floyd fan, everything they've done. I've, I've been um, 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 in love with, if that's the right term. Um, but I think it, 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 it holds a lot more truth today. I'm in my 60s now, and that the concept is a lot more closer to, to me now than it was in 1973. But, but it also reminds me of some of the things that Chris just talked about. Um, everything, our lives, our business lives, our personal lives, they're all filled with um, events, and the winners are the ones that take the event and do something with it, to, to grow, to, to be better at what they do. And, and what just happened, while well, I know we, uh, David and I spend a lot of time talking about the, the, the pandemic and what the root cause was, but the truth is, it's happened, it's here, our lives are what they are, and if we're in business, it is what it is, we need to be able to make make it work, right? Because we can't change it. It's not going to uh, go away. We can either deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis and make it help us be better at what we do, or we can go away because that's really the, the those are the two options: get better, make the changes, embrace the 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 new normal. I hate I, I hate that word too, but I'll yep. say it. Um, embrace it and and make it what you do, right? And that, that's really the gist of it. Every day will be something, tomorrow there'll be something else. Um, but today you have to embrace what you have to do today to be successful. And a lot of companies, specifically in the grocery business, have a hard time doing that. And now they just got the ultimate um, requirement, do it or you're, you're gone. And um, so that's, that was the intent of the, of Thank the you, Randy survive, pivot, 
cope, right? And and what yep. you said, everything you said, Randy, we have to embrace on a personal level as well. Yep. Keep saying, keep moving. Every day is new. Driving us crazy. Can't go. Listen, I've been working from home as a broadcaster for a dozen years or more, but I'm used to being able to go out at night. I love to play my drums at open mics in taverns around the Raleigh Durham area and going to our community clubhouse to play with the big rock and roll band I'm in. And I'm, I'm the chick drummer and the MC for that. We can't do that anymore. We got to figure it out. I can't just go out to a restaurant with friends. I love going to an AMC theater for a movie twice a month on a Friday night and eating out somewhere in the big mall at South Point here can't do that that uh, what's been taken away from me is the ability to get out of the house i'm not a problem in the house it's getting out of the house that part is gone so anyway blah 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 here we go evan bowler has sent us a quote from frank herbert's dune franklin patrick herbert jr 1920 to 1986 was an american science fiction author best known for the 1965 novel dune and its five sequels the dune saga set in the distant future and taking place over millennia explores complex themes such as the, well, look at what we're talking about today, Evan, long-term survival of the human species, human evolution, planetary science and ecology, intersection of religion, politics, economics, and power in a future where humanity has long since developed interstellar travel and settled many thousands of worlds. Oh my, here's the quote. The mystery of life isn't a problem to solve, but a reality to experience. Wow, you all picked really cool quotes. Evan, where'd you find this one? Thanks. This is, I'm, I'm a big sci-fi nerd. So uh, this one, Dune is just, it's, it's one of my favorite books, always has been um, since high school. So um, I think that it's extremely relatable and quotable. And um, there's a lot of great insights to draw from the book. And just kind of, I've incorporated a lot into my everyday life um, from this work of, of science fiction. So um, I, I really like this quote for a lot of different reasons. I think that um, Dune is about a lot of different things, but if, if you boil it down into, into its simplest sense, it's, it's what you just kind of described. It's, it's about survival, right? It's, an, it's the ultimate survival story. And so I think it's extremely relevant um, to QSR and restaurants today. Um, I think that this um, particular quote, um, the reason why I chose it was, Again, it's, uh, getting back to that experience uh, conversation we were having just a, a couple minutes ago, um, it's, it, there's a lot of challenges. You know, everyone knows that. Um, I, I think that if you look at the industry a couple months ago, even a year or two ago, um, we were moving in this direction, right? Um, everyone was moving towards a digital um, strategy, right? You kind of had to have it. It's, it's where the future was. It's just now it's a do or die moment. Um, I think that there's a lot of complexities when you're trying to figure out how do I, you know, create a great experience for my customers and how do I enfold all this technology into my current strategy. Um, but I think that, again, we're, we, we're all our diners, right, in our everyday lives, and we all know what a great experience is. And even though there's a lot changing around us and out from under us, I think that a great experience hasn't changed, right? Um, I think that that's going to continue to stay true. So if you can just find a way to, again, create that experience for your customers, it all starts there. That's, that's where it starts. Thank you very much. Our food is our survival, our sustenance, our passion, our inspiration, right, Chris? Food inspires us. It makes us think of other places, other worlds, and what the person cooking, preparing, serving it had in mind. And, and the, the, it's, a, it's a, almost a communal experience. Everything that brought the food to the table, to our door, whether we're in the restaurant, whether we're at home, we're on a picnic bench somewhere, it's all part of a, a community effort to bring that food to us, even if you just cooked it yourself. So thank you very much, David Gruen. And we have a quote from the Beatles, and this was actually from the song Within You, Without You, a song by the English rock band, the Beatles, from there. We are going back in time. We have a book from the 60s, somebody from the 70s, Beatles 1967 album, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. The song was written by lead guitarist George Harrison. It was his second composition in the Indian classical style after Love You Too, and was inspired by his stay in India in late 1966 with his mentor and sitar teacher, Ravi Shankar. I remember Ravi Shankar. Uh, for the Beatles' 2006 remix album Love, this song was mixed with the John Lennon written Tomorrow Never Knows, creating what some reviewers consider to be that project's most successful mashup. Here is the line, and life goes on within you and without you. Ooh, I'm getting goosebumps. Dave, talk to me. 
You know, I love George's uh, introspective uh, infusion on the Beatles. It made such a huge impact. But uh, this keeps within the theme of uh, everybody else's quotes, which is, you know, you never really realize just how much people are creatures of habit until something like this happens. And if people are creatures of habit, businesses are creatures of habit on steroids. (laughs) And so one of the interesting things about – um, a major right turn. Everybody's happy and things go well and people are comfortable when nothing changes. I mean, that, that's where, that's our comfort zone. But here's, here's the bottom line. Life's facts don't care about your feelings. So you can either ins- assimilate life's changes within you and move forward with it, or it's going to move on without you regardless. So, and we're literally seeing that with businesses now. Some businesses are angry. Some businesses are like deer in the headlights uh, and they're, they're really struggling. This isn't fair. You know, we were doing so well. Uh, the, the smart businesses are saying, how do, I, how do I become a better business? How do I find new ways of doing business? Because this is life now. So let's deal with it. And it's, it's a survival of the fittest, really. So it moves on with you or without you, but it's moving on. Thank you very much. We are moving on. Thank you all. I just put in the chat great quotes to everyone. I'm very impressed with how much thought you all put into it. So now is the time when we are going to get to our predictions, which is what the future of now is all about. Chef Chris Hall, I'm going to go to your prediction number one. I'll read a little bit. Uh, You've talked about this a little, but I want to crystallize it as part of the formal roundtable predictions part. Then I'll pick a uh, a statement from Randy and then one from Evan and one from Dave. And let's see how much we can share with our audience. So Chris Hall, Chef Chris Hall's number one prediction says restaurants will incorporate takeout and delivery into their models permanently moving forward. This will require a huge retrofit for many and a paradigm shift. Chris, I'm not going to read the rest. I'd love to hear it in your own words. Go ahead. Yeah, I just don't. I, I think it's part of our new world. I won't do when when we do our next restaurant, we will automatically build in the ability to do takeout and delivery. So that will be something that really, as someone that's not in that side of the business, right? Like Evans in that in that world where that's part of it. I, I would say, you know, takeout and delivery accounted for two percent of my business. Now it accounts for forty percent in twelve weeks. Right. So that will be something that we go into it thinking about where it was an afterthought before you know, we happen to get lucky and then we change point of sale systems to a much more modern uh, sort of something that's generally used in QSR. We were beta testing it for them in a full service restaurant setting, which meant that when this hit, we were uniquely qualified to do that. It wasn't uh, anything we planned. Obviously it was luck, but I think you're going to see there's just going to be, you're going to need added functionality. You're going to need ways to do all that, and that will be part of the restaurant model going forward. Chris, in in many of my business radio shows, we talk about businesses that digitalize, that nice, big, clunky word we like to use, not digitized, digitalized. And uh, yes, Randy, I'll get uh, Evan, one second. I, Evan is raising his hand digitally in the chat window. We talk about companies that digitalized and took that leap of faith to, to use cloud and to transform their digital journey before COVID. And we're talking every industry. Uh, We're talking anything to do with the supply chain, which is every industry, whether you're in automotive, any kind of other manufacturing, wherever you are. And so the question is, have restaurants embraced the need to have digital functionality? Chris, I'm just looking to you as somebody who is in the business, not just studying the business or talking about it. What does that have to do with their ability to do this retrofitting? Um, I I think those restaurants that are going to survive are going to embrace it. I mean, let's Mm -hmm. just look at it quite honestly. I would say in my segment, I mean, restaurants are all different, right? But in my segment, I expect at least 50% of restaurants to not exist by the end of this year. I think 20 to 25% won't even come back when restrictions are lifted. I think 20 to 25% won't have the capitalization the people or the, frankly, the, the desire to go back to it. So I'm looking at, you know, anywhere from 40 to 60% being out of the game. So those of us that remain in the game are going to have to adapt, like we talked about earlier, and you're going to have to change point of sale. You're going to have to add, you know, I mean, do you have a pickup window? Do you not have a pickup window? How are, like when I design a restaurant now, do it's interesting. I would never have thought about that a year ago. We were looking at a project before this all hit 
And that just wasn't something. And now that'll be top of mind when I go and I talk and I look at a space or I look at an architect like, okay, how am I going to do delivery out of here? Where's the ingress and egress? How are guests going to wait in line with some social distancing to pick up their food? Like I would never have thought about that. Now, top of mind. You have to. Thank you. Evan, you want to chime in? Evan Bowler, talk to Yeah, you. That's, ex- that's exactly what I was going to say. It, it's just, it's it's more than just about the technology piece, right? It's it's about what is the new store format going to look like, right? How do how do my employees supporting these processes, what like, what do their day, what does their day-to-day look like? What are that, what are the processes supporting the, the pickup in store and the delivery apps? What does that look like for them, right? So um, it's it's just focus on the whole piece, right? I think that um, if you look at the store format, I think that um, dining formats in in store dining are going to become smaller, smaller, safer kind of oriented formats, right? Um, but you're going to have to incorporate naturally, um, you know, like delivery folks or people coming in to pick up food because right now it's it's clunky, right? It creates a clunky experience for your customers when you have um, people who are just trying to get pickup orders coming in and standing in the front door and no one knows if they're waiting for a table or um, so I think that it's going to be a a big focus going forward. Definitely. The the store format's definitely going to change. Thank you, Evan. Thank you, Chris, for that. Randy Evans, I'm looking at prediction number one, food service as we know it will morph to include grocery stores. Randy, what are you thinking? The last three months have proven uh, amazingly challenged for all, all aspects, for, for, for restaurants, because they weren't prepared for the, for the I'll call it the lockdown of in-restaurant in, in eating, and grocery stores weren't prepared for that instant shift from food service to grocery, right? And so supply chains failed, um, and, and the concept of, of, of I'll say, a meal, um, really never existed in the grocery vernacular. And now it's changed, right? Because consumers, they still have the problem is that they don't have time, nor do they want to cook. And they're looking for ease and the grocery offering before was, we would call it uh, HMR, home meal replacement. Um, some goofy name that basically said a meal in a box. Um, and they were horrible. Um, they were, they were, they were not good. They were not restaurant quality. And if you go to any deli or, you know, in, in a grocery store, a classic deli, once again, you're not finding restaurant quality food there. You're finding grocery deli, which is not nearly the, the level of quality. Um, but as this, as this kind of morphs itself and the digitization of grocery continues, um, that that the merger between food service quality and food service experience and grocery, I believe, will take place. Chris just mentioned that 50%, maybe 60% of restaurants will be unable to continue operations. Um, and the ones that are left are going to be, you know, they're going to have to be digital. They're going to have, they got to change. They got to think about the consumer in a different way. I think that the, there's a great opportunity for the grocery industry to adopt food service best practices and, and to merge that concept of dinner um, with that grocery experience and be able to deliver that, to, to provide that quality meal um, as a part of their offering. And they're going to have to look to food service to do that because honestly, they don't know how to do it, right? They know how to deliver the ingredients of a meal, but they don't know how to deliver a meal. And that's where the, the, the food service um, folks would provide the best way forward for the grocery industry. Thank you. And I have a comment here from Chris Hall that says restaurants, we, meaning he representing restaurants, will enter the grocery space as well. Uh, Chris, you want to talk about this just for a minute? I'm ready to bring up Evan's uh, prediction number two, but I want to hear Chris. Go ahead, Chris. Sure. I, I think um, I, I just we're it's something we started because when supply chain disruption started, we have farmers that didn't they had excess product because they weren't able to get it to places that were traditionally buying it. So we took it and passed it on as a pass through to consumers. I think you've seen meal kits before and things like that coming from Blue Apron or whatever. You're just going to see when people want boutique items like maybe not staple items. Like if you don't care where your ground beef comes from, 
okay, got it. You're probably going to the store. But if you want grass fed, certified Angus, Prime, what you're gonna you're gonna have options with people like us, right? When you want that high end, hey, I mean, it, it, it's funny. Chefs get way too much credit for what we do with food. The secret to a great chef is that we find great ingredients and don't screw them up, right? <laughs> so people will want the direct connection to the ingredients that I can get, which I will then provide and charge them a pass through on that. Thank and you you'll pay me for my skill of cooking. Yeah, that's it's going to get bifurcated in that there's going to be restaurants as as a sustainability vehicle for eating, and then there's going to be restaurants that are experiential, right? And you're going out for an experience, and a and that, and that's going to be they're going to segment like that, in my opinion. I, I agree with that as a, a restaurant diner, a former restaurant diner. Evan, I'm going to combine your prediction number two and three. I think there's a nice link here. So you yeah. say consu- consumers will continue to demand fresher, healthier ingredients, creating complexity for traditional supply chains. And in prediction number three, you say connecting farmers, suppliers, and consumers would become an increasingly popular way to land in home kitchens, kitchens and drive new experiences with food and traditional shopping. Evan, briefly, what do you see? Yeah, I think that this is exactly what we're talking about, right? I think that on top of the fact that, listen, it, people are eating healthier, right? This, this, is, this is nothing new. This has been happening for a while now. But I think that for traditional restaurants, and I, I help a lot of quick serve restaurants, right? So I think big, big national quick serve uh, restaurant brand chains. Um, so that, that shift to a, a healthier, um, fresher model is a little bit more complex at, at, their, at their scale. Um, but I think that, um, you know, that's something that we've been seeing across the board. I think that it's just going to continue to shift, um, more and more in that direction. And, you know, we have to meet the consumers at what, what they want on the plate. Right. But then, um, kind of talking about the, the evolution of home shopping, right. And, and getting into consumers kitchens as these traditional restaurants, like the local steakhouse by me, they have to lift and shift their model, right. Because they can't have traditional in-house dining. So they're offering these meal kits, right? They offer pre-made burger platters that, you know, they've, they've formed. They've got the nice, you know, steak bur- burgers already made. They, they give you the cheese, the, all the vegetables that you need ready to go. And you're ready to have a, a grill out, right, in your backyard um, without kind of doing the prep work. And then you also get to experience kind of having that steakhouse right at home. So um, I think that there's something to be said for that. And I think that um, it's definitely become a – going to become a part of our uh, not new not new normal but just just normal right now <laughs> thank you very much we just got fan mail from Carrie Brown at SAP who referred us to Chris Hall and Carrie says loving the show today I knew Chris would be fabulous blah 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 thank you very much Carrie we love you too and I appreciate the introduction very very much we're always looking for sourcing of good guests we've got four great ones on the show today David Gruen has just had breakfast Dave before I read your prediction number one I want to know what you had because I watched you eating and drinking and you're making me hungry so Dave what was on the menu for you for breakfast today I had an awesome keto bar these things are amazing because I'm on a keto I've lost uh, 15 pounds Oh, uh, the keto ma- bar, yeah. mazel tov, as my people like yes. to say. Now, here's your prediction number one, Dave Gruen. Let me get you up here on view here. So you say families ah, have been reintroduced and in some cases first introduced to the importance of family bonding time, which has traditionally occurred over dinner. The epiphany that nurturing the family emotionally may be as important as nurturing them nutritionally will have numerous impacts on the entire food industry to include grocery, fast food, and full-service dining. That's interesting. I like that cultural part. Dave, talk to me. What do you see? Yeah, so this is a a fascinating phenomenon because, I mean, guys like Randy and myself, we've worked virtually for, in my case, 21 years. I'm used to, to working out of my house. But you've seen massive segments of the population who've been cocooning now for going on four or five months. And when you think about the average family, the average family in this country had less than three to four days of food in their house. Dinner was a last-minute decision or it was an individual endeavor. Um, and, and if you wanted an experience, you went out. Um, I've got two 20 year old, young 20 year old daughters and they have no food in their house. They go out for everything. Right. So this has changed everything. And when you've got people homeschooling, um, the home Depot sales have skyrocketed because people are improving their homes. Now all of a sudden the experience has been around 
what can we do together as a family? Because we're kind of forced to. And so dinner has become uh, an event. And it's where, and it used to be in my generation, I mean, you, you just were never late for dinner. Well, this is a, a, a shift that's occurring uh, in this in globally, actually, but most certainly in America, where people are sitting down now. And it, it's almost like an event where I think it has the ability to significantly help restaurants. Because I agree with Chris, I think a lot of these local restaurants are just going to be decimated. But if they're smart and say, hey, you know what, we'll, we'll do a lot of the legwork for you. We'll either give you the ingredients, we, we'll put together kind of the, the end result, give you the ingredients, or we'll package it up for you so that you can have that experience you would have gone out for at home. And I think as, as families begin to go through this and say, wow, you know, now I understand why our grandparents did this, it changes everything. It changes the, what grocery is going to offer. I think they'll try and ultimately pick up some of that experience within their own stores, um, most certainly impacts restaurants. And I think um, the, the, the web services and innovation that will spring up around this new phenomenon, we can't even predict yet, but you know it's going to happen. This is, a, this is a huge force, and then that influences a lot of future generations as these kids uh, become parents. And now, you know, it, it, this nobody was ever home for dinner. It's all of a sudden now dinner's a big deal. Thank you very much. All good, good points. I have a comment here. My guests are using the chat so beautifully during the show, more than on previous shows, and I love it. Uh, Randy says, I think the grocers will reach out to restaurant industry for space in the store and help with the meal. We'll get to that in a second, Randy, but I have a comment from Chris Hall. Chris said, I did more business on Easter and Mother's Day kits that wow. I usually do in-house on those days. Chris, why wow. don't you just give us about a minute of commentary on that, please? I think it was just, we were one of the few places that adapted early and were willing to do that. And those are special days, particularly Mother's Day, where, you know, mom, dad, and the family want mom to have a special day. And so we offered a kit. We went so far as to include a local florist in it. So we had flowers in there. We had gifts in there. We had a full meal. We had uh, mimosas. I mean, it was just a brunch. You basically got brunch. You got flowers for mom. You, you, you know, and, it, and we made it so, yeah, you had to cook bacon or do pancakes, but it was relatively easy to do. And we did more of those than we normally would. We did more volume in that day than we normally would. Part of that, I will say, is based on demand for when that time was in our, our early adoption. But we've seen things like you were talking about, whether it's, whether it's, uncooked or pre-cooked, we've had an unqualified success doing what we call family meal, which goes to your point about people being around the dinner table. We offer a family meal for four every night now. It's a takeout or delivery meal. It costs anywhere between 70 and and $100, right? You're getting, you know, some sort of little snack. You're getting a salad. You're getting a full meal and you're getting dessert. And because it's coming from us, it's actually giving us an edge. You know, I haven't talked about the, the desire to be more healthy. They know where the food's coming from. It's traceable. It's generally more healthy. I'm getting an edge up on, on the competition by doing that. It's been an unqualified success. Thank you. Very that's glad the, to hear that. Go ahead, Randy. That, yeah, that's the innovation. That's the, what I was kind of getting to at the very beginning. The, the new world, well, the world, because it's really not new, it, <laughs> it, it fosters innovation. That's, that's the one, that's the definition of success today is the ability, like Chris just said, to do something he had never done before and to, to incorporate it into his everyday process. And it's, it's, what it's what the customer's looking for. It's what, it's what should be driving the way we approach our business. And, and Rand Randy, you made a comment. I want you to talk about this as one of your predictions. We're jumping around a little, but we've got six minutes left. So I want to get this one in. You say, I think grocers will reach out to a restaurant industry for space in the store and help with the meal. Uh, in my local Harris Teeter, there is a Starbucks. So yep. they have brought in, we're not just going to make coffee with whatever we're selling or what's on sale in the store. We're going to have a professional barista, if you will, there with their own counter, their own branding, their own label, their own cups, selling their own mugs, their own carry out coffee containers, whatever it is, and, and bakery goods in our store. Okay, they do their own uh, at the bar. You can order a meal. They have a takeout stand, Randy, at this Harris Teeter where they offer a particular style. One day it's seafood, one day it might be ribs. And people line up literally out the door to pick up food and take it home. Or you can right. eat at tables in the bar. So what are you seeing, Randy, just briefly in terms of well, giving space to a restaurant? Go ahead. That, that's, uh, that's 
I think you're going to see more and more and more of that. Grocers are going to go, you know what? I'm not going to fight with food service anymore. I'm just going to invite them into the store because they're going to, you know, they're going to, the, the consumer wants it. And anytime you don't do what the consumer wants, you lose, right? And this is not just a, a lot of times we always talk about this in the context of high end meals, but go to any Hispanic um, um, focused grocery store. We have several here in Southern California. Vallarta, North Cape Gonzalez, Cardenas, every one of those has a full service restaurant inside of the store that offers in exceptional food. Not, not just and then, but uh, uh, um, destination food quality. So I, I think, I don't think you're going to see grocery in the future without some kind of restaurant quality um, operation with ins inside the store but also incorporating it into their digital strategy and, and providing that for a home meal as well. Thank you very much, Randy. I have 45 seconds apiece for a final prediction on the future of dining, the future of eating, the future of cooking, the future of bringing a kid in or going to an experience outside with something you made yourself or delivery apps. I know we started out with talking about home delivery apps, but we have covered a much broader base of the restaurant industry and the topic of what's for dinner. I think that was really my topic. So let's go around the table, 45 seconds each. Let's be really, really tight. Chris Hall, please wrap up 45 seconds. What's your final prediction? Uh, I think that Ghost kitchens were five years ahead of their time and that I'm looking for 1,200 to 1,500 square feet without tables where I can do takeout and delivery and it becomes a restaurant in and of itself. So that's my next concept. I'm on record as saying it. We're looking for the space now. So if there's anybody in Atlanta that knows, uh, 12 to 1,500 square feet, we do three to four meals a day. You pick them up or we deliver them, just like we were talking about the family meal a few minutes ago that's going to be a future segment in restaurants. Thank you. Great prediction. Randy Evans, you're up next. What do you see? The lines are blurred. There's no, the, the future of food is a combination of classic grocery and exceptional uh, restaurant quality. And, and the, the single entities will be able to deliver both. Thank you very much. Evan Bowler, what do you see in the crystal ball? I'm definitely echoing Chris and I'm saying uh, the focus on the new store format and owning, owning the delivery channels and again, creating a great experience for your customer, just focusing on your customer's experience and, and starting there and, and working back from, from that. Thank you. And David Gruen, who is sitting in a grocery store, by the way, with lots of fresh fruit and vegetables. I see oranges and apples and maybe tomatoes. And you've just made me hungry looking at your I'm making a basket. fortune right out of this office. <laughs> um, so for better or for worse, uh, we are in the midst of a food service or food industry forest fire, like, a, like nature's purging. Um, the, the things that just need to be burnt away because they're no longer adding value to the infrastructure will be purged. The innovation, the new growth that comes out of that will be amazing to see. I think it changes everybody's lives, but at the end of the day, it's going to be an, an, an amazing new experience for everybody. It's a, it'll be a good thing. Thank you. I'd love to get the four of you back on a show later in the year and we can look back at your predictions and your thoughts, Chris especially, and our three industry experts and see where things have come. So remind me to give you a date. Maybe we could do this before Thanksgiving in November. If you'd like to come back and join me, I'd love to revisit. We'll do this um, What's for Dinner Part 2. That would be great. I have one minute to wrap up. I want to say thank you to my co-producer, Ryan Treasure, the voice of the opening. Thank you to Aaron Keller, our engineer extraordinaire who gets us on the air keeps us there. A big hug to Carrie Brown. You're wonderful. Thank you for introducing us to Chef Chris Hall. Chris, a pleasure to meet you and a pleasure to see you, Evan and Randy and Dave. Thank you so much. So I'm Bonnie D. Graham. Thank you for tuning in to Technology Revolution, the future of now. Remember, if somebody tells you the future is already here, look at them and say, no, 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 you're wrong. That was yesterday's future. <laughs> We're all here right now today making today's future. And let's Damn it. Let's make it a good one. Everybody be safe, be healthy, mind where you go, who you see, what you do. Keep your mask on if that's what you want to do. And just make sure we keep everybody safe. Hugs and kisses to everybody for listening. We love you. Bye-bye. Everybody wave. Bye. Thank you for joining us for Technology Revolution, the future of now. Mark your calendar to join host Bonnie D. Graham 
every Wednesday at 8 a.m. Pacific Time, 11 a.m. Eastern on the Voice America Business Channel to hear how technology is impacting your future now. Oh